Okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, welcome to my presentation about our work on identifying uh, cache-based side channels through uh, secret augmented abstract interpretation. Uh, so this is a joint work uh, with Shui Wang, Yuan Bao, Xiao Liu, uh, Dan Feng Zhang, and uh, Ding Hao Wu. The majority of the work was done when the others were working on, uh, for uh, Pennsylvania State University. So I think everyone in this room are familiar with uh, side channels, right? So the side channels talk about in this uh, presentation is about attackers inferring uh, secrets where secret dependent physical information uh, without direct access to the uh, computer systems. So by observing, when you have different values for the uh, secrets, you may have different like execution time, uh, power consumption, uh, EM emissions, sound, light, and heat. And one of the most infamous side channel is residing in the uh, computer uh, components, like the uh, microprocessor cache. So cache-based side channels are existent from it because we have a hierarchical uh, memory system. So besides, in addition to the slow, uh, high capacity uh, mem memory, which is better uh, segregated, uh, we have a shared, uh, low, uh, fast on chip, but low capacity uh, storage uh, called cache. So uh, previous research has shown that this shared cache are, can be problematic. Uh, they leak information uh, like a sensitive information, like a crypto keys. And those attacks are extremely penetrating because they are cross VM, they can be cross core, and they, are, uh, they affect most mainstream architectures, Intel, AMD, and ARM. And so, uh, the infamous CPU vulnerabilities ca called Spectre and Meltdown are somehow related to the uh, cache based side channels. Okay, so the basics of the cache, uh, minimal storage units of a uh, cache is uh, a cache line. So typically it's a, 40, a 64 byte storage unit uh, in the hardware. So when you have, when you have a, uh, a memory lookup operation in, the, uh, in, your, uh, in your code, you get an address. And simply speaking, the higher bits of this address determines which uh, cache line you're going to access for this operation. Um, okay, so uh, in our work, we assume such a threat model. Uh, the victim process and the malicious process are living on the same physical uh, CPU chip, and they are sharing certain level of cache. And the, the attackers can learn victims' cache line access patterns uh, with some well-established cache sniffing techniques like uh, uh, prime probe and flush reload. So within this threat model, how does the uh, attacker learn your secrets? So consider this example. Um, you have a secret called K and use this secret to directly access some memory uh, table. Then uh, you have different memory access address and you uh, end up with accessing different lines of the cache. So under our uh, threat model, attackers can learn this and he can learn at least one bit information leakage if your different secrets uh, can lead to different uh, cache access lines. So we want to detect this kind of uh, possible leakage, potential leakage in your code, uh, especially in your binary code. So, so here we propose a two-step approach uh, to detect this uh, uh, cache-based side channels. Uh, consider this, still consider this operation. So our first step is to model secret-dependent uh, secret information flow. Uh, we describe cache access uh, patterns with SMT over um, uh, secret and non-secret values. Uh, and then in the second step, we check the side channels by solving certain uh, constraints. And if there's a solution to this constraint, uh, that means uh, there's a potential uh, information leakage. 
Okay, so uh, more details for the how we uh, construct this constraint. So still consider this example. Uh, we construct a formula to describe the uh, memory address, the relationship between the access address and the secret. So in this simple, simple example, if you assume the base address of the table A is 84 and the uh, size of an element is four, then uh, this memk function describes the uh, is a mapping from your secret from uh, to the address, memory access address. Then it's going to be uh, 84 plus 4 multiplying k. Okay. Then we get this uh, function. We pro, uh, perform a alpha conversion. Uh, we replace the name of k with k prime. Then we get to similarly looking uh, formulas. Uh, so what we do next is we construct this constraint. So memk not equal uh, memk prime. So intuitively, I mean, this uh, constraint means that if this, you can find a solution to this constraint. That means you, you can find two different uh, secret values that can lead to different mem memory access locations. Um, but yes, we are not only looking at memory access, we are looking at uh, cache access. So. Uh, recall that the lower L bits of the address is irrelevant to uh, uh, cache line access patterns, uh, where L is the logarithm of the uh, cache line size. So we simply discard the lower uh, L bits by making a right shift, which is friendly to the constraint solver. So if this newly constructed constraint is solvable, that would mean you get a, a potential um, information leakage, which is dependent on the, your secret uh, value of k. And if it's not solvable, that would mean this uh, memory operation is independent from k, which means it's going to be safe. OK, so back to the first step. How do we exactly construct the memory access formula for all memory operations in the binary? Uh, our previous work, uh, present two years ago in the same venue, we are using a trace-based analysis. So basically, we uh, execute your uh, program and get a binary trace, and we perform symbolic execution over this trace. So we can get a very precise construction of the uh, formula. Um, however, this will have a limitation that you won't be able to cover your whole program. And uh, so, uh, we're tr we're trans in this work, we are transitioning from the dynamic pro approach to a static approach, such that we can use static analysis to cover the entire program, to uh, cover the all possible program execution states. So our static analysis relies on the uh, abstract interpretation technique. Uh, basically, if you are uh, doing analysis over concrete uh, program states, that's going to be very complicated. Uh, and it's very hard to verify certain uh, security, pro uh, security properties over uh, concrete states. So what, what abstract interpreting do is it lifts your concrete uh, program states into a simplified abstract domain and then perform analysis over this uh, simplified domain. And finally, we can uh, verify the approximation of the original security property. So this, is, uh, this has been proved to be a scalable approach over production software. OK, so how exactly we, do we uh, combine abstract interpretation with symbolic execution? Uh, the naive approach would be uh, tracking all the formulas, all the constraints over, uh, over the path, over the CFG, and record every possible information as precise as possible. And I think you can imagine this would be uh, problematic, uh, mainly due to the scalability issue, uh, since symbolic formulas will just keep growing and value set variables uh, on the stack and heap will keep growing. Uh, we have a tentative test for this naive method on uh, OpenSSL, it's RSA algorithm. Uh, we to, it takes us days and over 100 gigabyte memory to do this analysis, but it still can't finish. 
So clearly, we're, we need to look for other opportunities for um, optimization. So here we, we have two uh, observations uh, during our exploration. So first, variables of the secrets usually only exhibit at a very small portion uh, of the program, which means that the majority of the program states are actually irrelevant to what we're looking at. We are only caring about the secrets. And the second ob observation, at each program point. So only uh, very few variables actually carry the secrets. So this case gives us opportunities for optimization. So what we do is we further do further uh, abstraction on those non-secret value uh, information. So we can see here in the mem uh, memory store, we got uh, uh, several uh, memory locations which are irrelevant to the secret K. So what we do, we just discard the details about these uh, values. We forgot about what they actually, uh, how they actually are computed, and we just mark them, represent them with a unified symbol called P. But we will keep track of the uh, secret values as much details as we can. So then we end up uh, getting a uh, abstract domain with four components. We have a, a unified symbol P for public information, and we have a detailed symbol symbolization for the uh, secret values. And then we need to model the uh, stack pointer because we are doing a uh, interprocedural analysis. This helps us to track information over the function call boundaries. And of course, we, are, uh, we need to be precise about the uh, numeric values. Okay, so uh, the details uh, about how we construct the abstract domain and how we uh, do abstract interpretation can be found in the paper uh, and together with the sound, soundness proof. But the key message here I want to uh, deliver is that um, our improved method, augment, secret augmented abstract domain, is able to scalably model uh, production software with over 80K uh, instructions. And the results are very satisfying. We uh, discard certain information about the public, inf uh, public values. Uh, still, we pre pre preserve uh, precise enough um, secret value information to identify those side channels. Okay, evaluation. Uh, we have performed, uh, we have tried our tools on those uh, widely used crypto systems, uh, a total of five of them. And the results is that we, uh, in this early version of libgcrypt, we discovered some uh, previous known uh, vulnerabilities. And then for the other three systems, we discovered previous unknown vulnerabilities. And uh, for the last one, for this uh, later mm, version of libgcrypt, we found it's, uh, it's safe within our threat model. Okay, so to actually verify the results of the static analysis, we also did a uh, simulation for one of our cases. So we built up a uh, simulation simulator based on Gen5, uh, configured two-level caches, and then uh, because our work, our approach is based on symbolic execution, we can actually find a counterexample or concrete values to demonstrate the, uh, the uh, leakage. So we uh, send the values to the simulator and get the results. We actually found that all the cache line access variants are, are really there based on the results of the simulator. And more interestingly, we find uh, this, this, in this case, this leakage case, you can actually get more observable information uh, because these two different secret values lead to different cache states, uh, the hit miss patterns. This is not directly related to our threat model, but it's uh, a still very important result. Okay, so the, our findings are reported to the developers. Um, some of them are confirmed and patched and the others turns out to be not mm, really exploitable because there are some other countermeasures already deployed, uh, like the RSA blinding um, to, to randomize the exponent of the, uh, of the uh, secrets. 
and then the others are turns out to be uh, to to be safe. Then uh, this also is cross validated with other research work. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have for today. Okay, thank you very much for the nice talk. So, are there any questions, please? Hi, uh, thank you very much. I'm here to from Yukon. Uh, so, very interesting. Uh, I just want to confirm so, when you do this uh, evaluation, what is the secret variables or the private information? The key bits are obviously used also to compute stuff on the ciphertext, plain text, right? So these are also probably kind of tainted, right? So this, the, all of that becomes tainted, but it just still is not too much variables. Am I correct? Or? Uh, so yeah, I mean, secrets okay. must be used for the computation, but in certain cases, if our software is well designed, you are using the secrets, but they don't lead to different memory access patterns. They don't live, but they are influencing some parts of the storage of the variables, right? They influence the plain text and the, they are used in the computation of yeah. plain text and ciphertext, right? And because, because they could also be used for like key scheduling and stuff. So if you only look at the s secret information and not at the impact of computation using the secret information, then you could still have leakage. For example, when you have key scheduling. So I was assuming that when you talk about the secret information, or private information, you also consider anything which is computed using it, which would include, you know, ciphertext, plain text, and so on. And when you said it's not too much, you included all of that, and not just the, the real keys, because probably you cannot differentiate, could you? Uh, I mean, if you compare with those tainted values with the entire program states, it's not too much, but still, uh, I mean, if you just look at it, it's going to be very a, a lot of information. Yes, um, so that's right. exactly what I'm asking. So did you do, when you say, the, what, what are you doing? That's what I'm asking. Do you look only at the original secret information, private no, information? No, 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 wait. No, tent. you also look at all of right. it, for example, public ciphertext, uh, text. OK, great. Yeah. So it's just, this is still not too much. Right. Great, that's what I thought. OK, just one small additional question. How do you actually identify the, the, the private keys initially as input for your program. Is this a manual process? Uh, yeah, that part has to be manual. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, that was very interesting. I mean, I noticed at the end that you reviewed, a, you looked at a couple of standard cryptographic libraries. There is at least one more out there, the NACL library, which has been explicitly designed to avoid these types of vulnerabilities. I wonder if you've looked at that one or considered looking at it. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, we didn't look at that. Um, but we do uh, encounter some cases you mentioned. You, uh, in some of those cases, we have, to be honest, we have, this is standing lenses, we have false alarms. Right. And in some of our false alarms, false positives, we found that uh, people are using those kind of techniques to avoid those uh, um, uh, leakage, like uh, scatter and gathering uh, result, uh, techniques and pre-computed tables, pre-loading tables, they are all using those uh, uh, tricks to, to avoid those. So I don't know uh, the details about the project you mentioned, but certainly part of those projects we've tested uh, are considering these uh, problems. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. This is all fascinating and quite new to me, so my question may reflect a certain degree of naivete. Um, the constraint solver, uh, mm -hmm. is, is that decidable? Will you always get a, can this be solved or not? Uh, I think in our cases, we don't have a problem, problems in getting those solved. I mean, if you're, uh, the solvers itself are, are, are I think it's, it's uh, decidable. Okay, uh, yeah, you. if you can construct, if you get the constraint, you can uh, solve it. But, of course, in certain cases, you can't even get the constraint. That's a problem. We okay. have some uh, widening techniques to, to, to make sure we are getting sound results. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, Daniel Genkin, University of Michigan. Uh, how do you know what's the granularity of the channel? So you mentioned that uh, you're using um, 
cash banks as your minimal unit, and you uh, right shift everything L bits to the right uh, before you even look at it. How do you know that this is sufficiently accurate? We had cash blade already where we went below ca a cash bank resolution. How do you know that, that's, that, that you're not missing bits? Uh, did you mention cash audit? Sorry? Uh, did you mention cash audit? No, I mentioned cash bleed. Cash bleed, okay. So uh, we are not doing very precise in that quantity of, uh, analysis on the, like, the degree of the leakage. We only consider whether there is leakage or not. Yeah, but scatter gather in the setting where you don't get below cash banks doesn't leak. Right. And as soon as you go below cash bank resolution, it does leak. So your bit shift L bits to the right just hit leakage. How do you know how many bit shifts to shift? Uh, that's decided by the cache line size. No, um, but we went yeah. below cache si cache line oh, size. Oh yeah, that, that's 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 I think that's uh, out of the scope of our consideration. We only consider that cache line size. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So I think we should move to the next talk. So let's thank the speaker again.